Ecuador's parliament did not make a decision regarding the president's veto on the bill that allows the termination of pregnancy in case of rape, thus allowing the text to enter into force with the observations made by the president, Guillermo Lasso. The government of Finland considers it likely that the country will join in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And the World Health Organization reported that the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases and infections exceeds 500 million on the planet since the beginning of the pandemic. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. And now we begin. Ecuador's parliament did not make a decision regarding the president's veto on the bill that allows the termination of pregnancy in the case of rape, thus allowing the text to enter into force with the observations made by the president, Guillermo Lasso. The parliament had until this Friday to pronounce itself on the partial veto. Otherwise, the norm will be inscribed in the official registry incorporating the modifications formulated by the executive. Among the modifications is that for the initiation of the medical procedure of an affidavit or medical examination that accredits the sexual aggression will have to be presented. On this, dozens of social organizations have pointed out that the objections of the national government impose conditions that are impossible for most of the victims to meet. El Salvador's police guild denounced on Thursday that police commanders are pressuring their officers to comply with a daily quota of arrests, which is being met with the arbitrary detention of innocent people. Marvin Reyes, the representative of the police guild of El Salvador, said that the police have arrested innocent people in order to meet the goals set by the executive. Reyes said that the police have been told they need to arrest 20,000 people per month, which has translated into pressure within the institution. More than 10,000 people have been detained so far after President Nayib Bukele requested and received congressional authorization for a state of emergency that allows police to make arrests without plausible cause or provide access to a lawyer. Nearly 12 days have passed and in these 12 days there has been pressure to reach a certain number of detainees. We've been told the total number of detainees after 30 days need to be 20,000. This is the parameter requested by the government authorities. In Argentina, the government and grain transporters agreed to create a multi-sectoral dialogue table to address current problems after several days of strike. After four days of transport strike, the members of the Federation of Argentinian Transporters participated in a meeting with representatives of several rural entities organized by the Ministry of Transportation. During the meeting, it was decided to organize a session of the dialogue table for May 15th with the purpose of reviewing fuel tariffs. It was also agreed to establish a conflict resolution committee for the dialogue between grain producers and transporters. In addition, the Energy Secretariat assured that it will guarantee the supply of fuel. In Peru, Cardinal Pedro Abarreto asserted that important changes are being prepared in the government of President Pedro Castillo, held at the government palace. These declarations were made in the framework of the coordination of the call for national agreement, in which he also assured that the President Castillo will appoint a new cabinet, as well as a new prime minister. The meeting was also attended by the Secretary General of the National Agreement, Max Hernandez, who stated that this call will be made in the next few weeks, and is expected that different sectors of society, such as the church, the business sector, and different social organizations will participate. In Peru, little over 10 months into Pedro Castillo's mandate, the opposition and the majority of media in the country continued to seek the presidential vacancy despite the severe social and economic crisis further heightened the last few days by the unfortunate death of five people and dozens of injured. Since Keiko Fujimori lost elections, popular force, the right-wing parties and the majority of the media haven't stopped trying to oust President Pedro Castillo. 
They are following a plan designed to vacate presidents, and with that, they intend to accomplish the goal they've set their minds on, which is to not acknowledge the electoral results of the past elections. They are carrying out this plan with vacancy motions, presenting claims unsuccessfully before the Organization of American States with draft bills and support from the media, no matter how severe the crisis the country experiences is. This creates an environment that weakens governability. We have returned, I think, to the 90s, when the headlines in the press all say, out with Castillo, Castillo is gone. It really is outrageous. For ex-premier and congressman Belido, nothing is free in politics. He can see these monopolies have set higher prices on food to create unrest and follow the strategy of pro-Fujimori congresswoman Martha Moyano to vacate the president just as she phrased it in an audio file recently leaked to the media. Now they go on to the third phase, which is to hit the population hard. And for that, they are generating shortages, raising the prices on products, so the people grow desperate and begin blaming the government about the situation. The congresswoman for Free Peru, Silvana Robles, criticizes Moyano's vacancy plan Robles also denounced Moyano to the Ethics Commission for instigating the protesters of April 5th, day in which a group of vandals and criminals wreaked havoc after Castillo declared a limitation of citizens' mobility. Reason why Ms. Moyano is in this indictment before the Council of the Ethics Commission, her voice can be heard clearly in an audio file where she talks of a plot to make Castillo resign his post. Eight months after the general elections, the laws benefiting the people are inexistent, and the draft bill to ban monopolies that raise the price of staple foods are only a patch in the torn cloth, when what the situation actually demands is a new constitution. This draft bill of banning monopolies is really only a patch for the constitution. No matter how much you prove laws, banning monopolies won't make the system work. We need a new constitution. The state needs to be restructured. That's the final cure. A new accusation to oust Castillo and a motion underway to cut Premier Torres out of the picture show how indifferent the media and the opposition are to the five deaths from recent violent outbursts in the country. Peru is shaken by the latest events, delay demands affecting those most in need don't seem to be enough when personal interests are in a way. Ramiro Angulo, Maquiavelo, Telesur, Lima. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The government of Finland considers it likely that the country will join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Helsinki authorities indicate that the people made the decision the country is becoming a member of NATO. In this context, the executive pointed out that the procedure of parliamentary debates must be complied with previous timeline. The government affirmed that it is aware of Russia's opposition to the country's possible membership in NATO. Moscow affirmed that this measure threatens stability in Northern Europe and asserted that it will place nuclear weapons in the Baltic if Sweden and Finland join the Transatlantic Alliance. And according to the Russian Defense Ministry, the Russian missile cruiser Mosca, which was damaged on Wednesday night, sunk while wandered town in storm. The ship was the flagship of the Russian Navy in the Asian Sea and was equipped with 16 Vulcan missile launchers. The Mosca was being towed to its destination port due to hull damage caused by a fire near detonating munitions. When it lost stability and sank in a storm sea previously, the Russian Defense Ministry reported that the cruiser had been seriously damaged by a fire on board the night before, which caused the detonations. Algeria closes itself to the Spanish beef market and increases the price of gas to the Iberian country in retaliation to Madrid's support to Morocco regarding the conflicts with Western Sahara. 
According to reports in the Spanish press this Thursday, there has been a de facto closure of the Algerian market for Spanish livestock farmers and commercial operators. The measure is in addition to the announcement on April 12th, in which Algeria warned that it will raise the price of gas to Spain and reported the signing of an agreement with the Italian government as a preferential partner in the energy supply at a time when access to gas takes special relevance due to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. The trigger for this situation is the Spanish endorsement of the autonomy plan proposed by the Morocco for the Sahara to the detriment of the recognition of Western Sahara as an independent nation, a decision which has also led to the Polisario Front to suspend its contacts with Spain. And the United Nations announced on Thursday that it will raise, release, I beg your pardon, $100 million from its emergency fund for seven hunger hotspots. Yemen and six African countries, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan, South Sudan, and Nigeria. This was announced by the Secretary General spokesperson, Stefan Dujaric. Today, $100 million from the Central Emergency Response Fund was allocated to spots in Africa and the Middle East as the spillover of the Ukraine conflict threatens Europeans closer to famine. These funds will go towards relief projects in six African countries, those are Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Sudan, Sudan and Nigeria, as well as Yemen. The money will allow UN agencies and our partners to provide critical food, cash, nutritional help, as well as medical services, shelter and clean water. And Dujaric said that the conflict in Ukraine is driving up the cost of food imports, worsening food insecurity in aid recipient countries. Projects will also be tailored to help women and girls through a crisis that exposes them to additional risks. Armed conflict, drought, e and economic turmoil are the main drivers of food insecurity in the seven recipient countries. But the Ukraine conflict is making a dire situation even worse, uh, disrupting food and energy markets and driving up the cost of imports beyond the reach of consumers. In March, the Food and Agricultural Global Food Price Index hit its highest level since 1990. Now we address other topics. The death toll from the devastating floods in South Africa rose to 395 on Friday, mainly in the Durban region on the country's east coast. Police, army and volunteer rescuers on Friday widened the search for those still missing five days after more than 340 people died in the deadliest storm to strike Durban. The unprecedented floods left a trail of destruction. Travis Trower, a director for the volunteer-run organization Rescue South Africa, said these teams had found only corpses after following up 85 calls on Thursday. Meanwhile, volunteers with hand gloves and trash bags fanned across the city's bridges to pick up debris left by the massive storms, ahead of an expected surge of Easter weekend holiday makers. Well, if you think about it, at the moment we've got such devastation with plastics and that in our own we're basically killing our oceans, and if we don't look after the ocean, we won't have a beach to appreciate in future years to come, and neither will our children. So it's important that people are educated, get the plastics out of the beach, stop the microplastics in the, in the, in the sea and the pollution that's killing off our oceans. Look, the task, is, it's a mammoth task. Um, it's a long way to go, but as you can see by the number of we have around us here, they're all banded together. This is just one beach of three other beach cleanups going on concurrently. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The World Health Organization reported that the total number of confirmed coronavirus infections exceeds 500 million on the planet since the beginning of the pandemic. The health 
Situation and institution pointed out that more than half a billion cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed in the world, as have the 6.19 million deaths caused by the coronavirus on a global scale. The WHO also detailed that the regions with the most infections are Europe, with at least 100 million cases. America, with 150 positive cases, and Southeast Asia, with 58 million infected. Africa, on the other hand, is in the region where the coronavirus has the lowest incidence. The WHO warned that the number of infections could be 97 times higher than what is reflected on the official statistics of each country. And the Chinese mainland reported 3,472 new locally transmitted COVID-19 cases, of which 3,200 were reported in Shanghai, according to the National Health Commission's report on Friday morning. The locally transmitted tally includes 404, which were recategorized as confirmed cases from asymptomatic cases. No new fatalities or suspected cases were reported on Thursday. On Thursday also, 1,430 patients were discharged from a hospital after recovery and 28,778 close contacts were released from medical observation. As of Thursday, the Chinese mainland community reported 17,950 imported confirmed cases, with no fatalities. Among them, 17,667 were discharged from hospital after recovery and 283 remained in hospital, with no severe cases. A total of 30,574 confirmed cases, including 854 fatalities, were logged in in the region in China. This Friday, Israeli troops attacked the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holy site for Muslims, while hundreds of Palestinians were reforming and performing prayers for the holy month of Ramadan. According to the latest report, 152 Palestinians were injured after a crackdown on protests in East Jerusalem and a subsequent assault on the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The official Wafai news agency reported that dozens of uniformed men entered the sanctuary and attacked the thousands of Muslim worshippers performing the dawn prayer. During the raid, the military used the live bullets, rubber bullets, stun grenades and tear gas without any consideration for the elderly, the women and the children in the premises. Brutality by Israeli police forces has been caught on camera and disseminated through social networks. Let's take a look. In the footage, we can see a group of Israeli uniformed men escorting a handcuffed Palestinian child, while there is another kid laying in the ground wounded as a consequence of Israeli repression. Another footage shows a Palestinian cameraman and a journalist were wounded while covering the repression. The occupation regime has exponentially increased the arrests and aggressions in the occupied West Bank, which has caused the death of several Palestinians in the last few days. And the imam of the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem condemned the brutality of the occupation forces and said that violently bargaining into the third holiest place in Islam is a line not to be crossed. Today there were two eruptions in Al-Aqsa Mosque. The first during the dawn prayer and the second where women and men were oppressed as well as all the people who were in the courtyard of the mosque. The second attack occurred at 8.30am. The assault was made inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Masjid Qibli. More than 80 young people inside the Holy Mosque were displaced. This repression and barbarism is committed by the occupation to repress our people and empty Al-Aqsa Mosque. The occupation knows that Al-Aqsa Mosque is a red line that must not be crossed. For this mosque we sacrifice our hearts and blood and we condemn it on behalf of our people and all those present at the mosque. And North Korea celebrated Friday the 110th anniversary of the birth of its founder Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of his current leader Kim Jong-un. According to local media, celebrations including a lanterns festival, dances and fireworks. The holiday is known in the country as the Day of the Sun. At the Lantern Festival, which was held in the center of the capital Pyongyang, they displayed light sculptures in the form of national symbols, such as Mount Pike II, a domestically manufactured tank, and the birth of Kim Il-sun. On the occasion, they also issued some commemorative postcards featuring the late leader.
And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.